Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 73 and at long last the schedule for the trip to America in April is available appearing on your screen now. So as you can see I've marked the dates and locations where I'm going to be and what ships are my primary targets for visitation. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be spending the entire day on a given ship. It may be that it only takes a few hours to go around to such a ship. And so if there's any nearby naval museums, etc., then perhaps after lunchtime I'll visit those. Now, the columns are divided up into two sections for the location. So the daytime, as just said, um, and then in the evening, where my evening is completely free and there's an opportunity for everyone to meet up uh, uh restaurant or diner or some other appropriate location to be determined then uh, probably in proximity to the uh, ship then obviously that will be um, advertised close to the time and other evenings I will be in transit on a flight or some other form of transportation and so obviously I won't be available for those so those have been marked up but obviously um, on the days especially in places where I'm going to be in a city for a single day like Norfolk, Wilmington, Charleston etc um, then where there's where, the, where there's a situation where I'm only available during the day then I will be taking an extended lunch break or possibly the afternoon depending on how long it takes me to look around the ships in question which will provide an opportunity for people to meet up if they want to uh, that doesn't involve chasing me around the depths of a ship while I desperately try and film everything. So there we go. Any questions, obviously, please feel free to ask. And uh, for those of you who have offered uh, accommodation dash transportation, my deepest thanks to all of you. Uh, and of course, I'm not going to be publishing your details on the video here. Um, I do respect people's privacy. Anyway, today's questions are taken from the videos on HMS Rodney and the Forgotten Fleet, the US sailing fleet of the early 19th century. So let's get on with those. Kendra Malm asks, what are the effects on performance of variations in the rifling of naval guns? Is there an optimal depth or width of the grooves, tightness of the spiral or orientation of the spiral for a given size or caliber? So it's quite a complex question, but can be boiled down to some relatively simple rules. Now, obviously, rifling, as hopefully most people know, in a gun barrel is a series of grooves that are carved into the barrel of the gun, which then engage with the shell, in this case, being it's a naval uh, cannon, and those grooves then cause the shell to spin as it accelerates up the barrel, which makes them more stable, more accurate, and longer range. But why is that? Let's do a little quick potted history. So the reason you get more accuracy, better range, etc. out of a rifled barrel is because the rifling allows you to put a relatively soft jacket or band or whatever you want to call it around your projectile and that will engage with the rifling and that forms a near enough perfect seal which contains the pressure in the chamber much, much better, which means you get a lot more of the energy is imparted to your projectile, which obviously then means it will go further. As well as this, it also means that the projectile is held in a relatively static position in terms of horizontal or vertical moment, uh, motion, which means that the projectile, again, is only traveling forwards and it's not bouncing around inside the uh, gun as would happen if you were using a smooth bore unless said smooth bore was using incredibly tight tolerances and in the time period we're talking about most of these tolerances weren't actually achievable this is why for example tank guns for a long very long time used rifled guns and it's only recently with a relatively modern advances in uh, gun technology that you've had the ability to have smooth bore tank guns that can maintain their accuracy as well as 
rifled gun. So the answer to your three specific questions, once you take into account that background, is, ironically enough, the rule of thumb of what is just enough. Because if you make the grooves too deep, for example, then you're actually increasing the overall width of the gun unnecessarily, which makes the gun heavier. You're also increasing the overall width of the shell unnecessarily, at least on the rotating band, uh, because obviously it's got to reach all the way into those grooves, and you're increasing the chance of failure in the grooves that are being cut. So you want the grooves to be just deep enough and wide enough to engage and impart the, the spin to the shell that's necessary and no more. Obviously, if you make them too shallow, it might not engage, you might get slippage, etc. Um, so it has to be calculated on a per gun basis. And even guns of the same caliber might have different needs of groove depth and width based on the pre working pressures of the shell involved. So for example a 15 inch 42 caliber gun that the Royal Navy used would need a different set of rif rifling uh, depth and width to the grooves as compared to say an Italian high velocity 15 inch gun. And with the tightness of the spiral again it's a case of what is just enough because if you make the spiral too loose then you're not going to get enough spin going um, whereas if you make the t spirals too tight you run two risks one is you might make the shell spin so quickly that it will fly apart um, this would be particularly more vulnerable uh, more vulnerable when you're talking about HE shells rather than AP shells um, but also the tighter the spiral the more of the energy from the gun is going into spinning the shell as opposed to moving the shell forward so you're going to drop the muzzle velocity and if it gets really tight then obviously there's going to be a lot of force exerted on the rifling on on the rotating band which could lead to failure and then it basically acting as a really crude smooth bore when it will get stripped off so again it's a matter of calculation and testing to work out just exactly what uh, amount of rifling you need to get the shell up to the appropriate spin stabilized speed um, and no more with larger guns you need less tightness of the spiral because the ro rotational moment with a larger diameter shell is obviously greater which then means you don't have to get it up to quite the same speed as a smaller caliber weapon so for example a, a six inch or an eight inch gun will generally have tighter spiraling than a 15 or 16 inch gun and then finally with the rotation uh, the orientation sorry of the spiral left hand or right hand the main thing is you want them to all be the same for a set of guns in a specific turret but to be perfectly honest most of the time it doesn't make too much odds outside of that. The only thing is, and this is where you get onto a really sort of geostrategic level, is are you expecting to engage mostly in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere because obviously you have the Cor Coriolis effects, which do actually affect shells in flight when you're talking about long-range battleship engagements. And so in that respect, if you've got all your all your um, spirals in the guns on the right hand side or the left hand side for example depending on which hemisphere you're in there might be a very slight effect so if the um, if the rifle spiraling is in the same direction as the Coriolis force then in your particular hemisphere then the shells might veer off more to that side whereas if it's counter the shells might stay a little bit more on target but then that that kind of scenario can be changed around simply by whether you're firing north or south so it has a very marginal difference and this is one of the reasons why you can never on battleship scale guns without some form of guidance to package on board the shell you can never guarantee exactly where your shell is going to hit because your direction of fire relative to your bearing on the compass because of things like the Coriolis force is going to change exactly where the shell lands so there's all fun and games with regards to that, so hopefully that gives a little bit of background. Glorfindel of Gondolin asks, in your opinion, what was the best looking aircraft carrier, oddest or funnest look funniest looking aircraft carrier, and most hideous aircraft carrier of all time? Well, for best looking, there's a fair bit of competition, actually. I kind of like uh, the USS Ford, the new uh, American carriers. 
Um, I'm also somewhat partial to the aesthetics of what the Indians managed to do with the Vikramaditya. Um, I also do like the Two Island approach on the Queen Elizabeth class, and so on and so forth. So there's quite a few. My my general tendency is I like carriers with their islands in the middle or further back. Carriers with islands that are quite far forward don't quite have the same aesthetic, at least for me. But if I had to pick one, I'd actually have to go with the original HMS Hermes. There's something relatively aesthetically appealing about the simplicity of it. it there's no fancy hull shaping, there's no fancy overhangs, there's no... it's literally uh, iron like you'd use to <laughs> to flatten clothes. It's an upside down iron with an island on it um, and the simplicity appeals to me. Uh, for Oddist, uh, I think I'm gonna have to go with USS Midway um, the poor old thing, as you can see here, went through so many refits, it's got all sorts of odds and ends sticking out of it at various weird angles. Um, the strange thing is, when you look at the more normal profile view of the Midway, along with the various things like the Kitty Hawks and the Enterprise and the Nimitzes, they all look much of a muchness, but it's when you take a look from above that you see that the latter ships generally have a slightly more planned out shape <laughs> the midway you can definitely see is a an old straight through carrier that's had numerous refits over its life you see the thing is if it wasn't for those that sort of odd protrusion it forward of the bridge and also at the uh, aft port quarter it would look pretty much like any other super carrier but with those added it's just a little bit higgledy piggledy and all over the place so it certainly takes the prize for oddest looking in my book at least and as for worst looking oh, there's a fair bit of competition <laughs> at the lower end of things as well but at the end of the day I have to go for this thing this is the Juan Carlos the first the uh, current Spanish carrier and I'm sorry, but what is this thing? It looks like a grey clay brick that somebody slammed too hard into a dockyard wall. The aesthetics of it are all wrong. The The ski ramp is vastly outsized for the size of the ship. It's as I said, just a massive grey slab. It rides far too high for its size. And yeah, it's just... It, it has no redeeming aesthetic value at all, and this is one of its better angles. If you look at some of the other angles, it literally looks like a, a rectangular cube with a with a bashed-in nose. Um, come on, Spain, you can do a lot better than that. Kyle asks, did no designer consider a heavy wooden citadel-like wall in the front and aft of the ship to prevent raking fire? It was considered, and there were a few attempts to implement it occasionally in ships. The main problems that ran into were the fact that to build a sort of a wooden bulkhead at either end of the ship of a similar thickness to the sides was such a weight that it would impose severe stresses on the ship, especially... Um, as the obviously ships narrow in the edge of sail, especially considerably they narrow towards the uh, bow and the stern. This was further complicated by the fact that when you're talking about a raking broadside, it's usually at point blank range, and at point blank range, even the sides of the ship weren't going to keep out cannon fire. So you'd compromise the structure of the ship, weigh it down, make it a lot slower and less maneuverable, and therefore more likely to be raked, and you probably wouldn't save them that much from the raking anyway. Uh, ironically enough, if you're talking about a heavy raking fire at kind of point blank range, you might actually make things worse because you'd be blasting wooden splinters down the deck as well as the cannonballs uh, so yeah you, you would to, in order for it to work you would have had to put it in massively massively like probably twice as thick as the sides of the ship bulkhead um, and the amount of structural compromises you'd have to make were just too much once as can be seen with this model once the Simmons and Seppings design revisions had come in then the sides of the ship were Sort of, they had the equal thickness brought round to the uh, prow and stern, and that did give the ship some additional protection from end on fire, but only at medium to long ranges. Um, and in that case, it didn't compromise the sh ship 
quite as much because it was part of the structure of the ship, so the overall weight increase wasn't as great, and uh, it was a direct contributor to the ship's rigidity anyway. Fred five two three four five four eight nine one four two asks, which was more inevitable, the defeat of Japan or the defeat of Germany in World War Two? The defeat of Japan by a country mile. Now, that's not to say that the defeat of Germany wasn't inevitable the way that Germans went about the war. It was. Obviously, it did happen. Um, but at the end of the day, Japan was, at the point that it was running, it was economically unsustainable without significant imports. It had managed to tick off America already before Pearl Harbor, enough that America was restricting its imports, uh, especially oil, and that meant that, well, they needed to get oil from somewhere, and getting oil from somewhere meant, well, pretty much declaring war on almost everybody who had interests in the Pacific, and more specifically, that involved trying to kick the US hard enough for the US to go down and stay down long enough for them to grab what they wanted and then hope for negotiated peace, which is possibly one of the greatest cultural miscalculations in modern history. Because, uh, yeah, once Pearl Harbor had happened, the odds of the US settling for anything resembling a peaceful or equitable solution whereby Japan got to retain a bunch of its conquests... Um, yeah, that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and given the economic disparity between Japan and the USA, it was a foregone conclusion. The war pretty much was lost the minute the first bombs dropped at Pearl Harbor. It was just a matter of reality catching up with the situation. Whereas Germany, starting World War II by attacking Poland and ending up at war with Britain and France, well... It knocked out France relatively quickly, at which point it had to face off against Britain. And then Hitler decided that declaring war on the USSR and then declaring war on the USA in addition was somehow a good idea. Um, well, yeah, let's see how well that ended up. But anyway, there are points within World War II where you could make a technical argument for Germany not necessarily winning, but not losing the war if they'd chosen a different path. So, for example, once it had taken over France and much of Eastern Europe, if Germany had decided, right, we're going to sit back and build up our defences against Russia then you not declaring war on the USSR, although there's a possibility the USSR would have declared war on Germany at some point in the future anyway. Um, at that point, you're also... If you avoid declaring war on America in support of Japan, that makes it much harder to bring America into the war, at which point the only people you've got to face off against are the British. Now, even then, that's no small task, because Britain alone was capable of outproducing and outcompeting Germany. However, if it had just been a case of Britain at war with Germany, the USSR kind of looking menacingly over uh, Germany's shoulder, and the USA focusing on Japan, because Germany hasn't declared war on it, it's difficult to see how Britain alone could have a, pulled off something to the scale of the D-Day landings, B, would have had any desire to, and C, even assuming that they somehow managed something on that scale, the odds of the British single-handedly liberating Western Europe in the face of the majority of the Nazi war machine, again, with minimal distraction from Russia, unless uh, Stalin decides that's the perfect opportunity to land. Yeah, that's that's a pretty tall order, um, to put it mildly. So at that point, Germany has not lost World War II. Um, it would kind of just peter out with both sides staring at each other angrily over the channel. Um, and there might be bombing and fighter raids and such like but there's there's not really a lot that anyone can do there it, w it would need at least one of the two other major powers the ussa or the ussr getting directly involved for then germany to lose the war and if 
uh, say for example the USA stays out of the war and just supplies Britain well Britain can't be invaded but if Germany's not interested in invading Britain then all it has to do is build up defences to throw back the USSR um, if dash when Stalin decides to attack so yeah it, it, it's defeat is nowhere near as inevitable as the defeat of Japan and even if uh, German uh, Soviet war is potentially inevitable the odds of that being a continuous part of the conflict that would we would then define as World War Two is pretty slim so it would be a complete it would probably end up being a completely separate conflict years down the line Glenn Ricafrente asks, it might be outside the scope of the channel somewhat, but you've said in the past the British blundered into their empire. How so? Okay, so it's not strictly naval, although it does involve a fair bit of naval activity and exploration, so I'll try and keep it relatively quick. Um, but basically, the British empire, territorial acquisition-wise, can be broadly divided into three phases. The what some people call the first British Empire, which was mainly consisting of the 13 colonies and a few other related bits and pieces, that part was relatively deliberate, albeit that it wasn't necessarily an attempt so much to create an empire as just we're colonizing these areas that appear to be relatively sparsely inhabited. Um, obviously the locals in the uh, what became the 13 colonies might disagree with that assessment but that was kind of what the the British at the time thought that kind of phase came to an end in with the sort of the American Revolution and their war for independence in the late 1700s so that part of the empire was it was it was a semi-deliberate thing they were deliberately going out and colonizing areas but it was not for imperial acquisition purposes it was more for well either offloading weird religious fanatics or finding areas to grow the new and lucrative crops like crops like tobacco and sugar and then we skip to the third phase of the British Empire. That bit was most definitely deliberate. So this is characterised by things like the Scramble for Africa, where a bunch of, well, unsurprisingly enough, the African colonies were picked up. That was a very deliberate imperial period, um, which generally came about in the latter half of the 19th century, uh, once people had gotten used to actually having an empire in the first place. But the bit that I most refer to um, when I talk about the British basically accidentally acquiring an empire, is the what you might in some ways term the rise of the second British Empire after the loss of the American colonies. This was a much more hodgepodge affair, and it, it kind of dovetailed into some of the uh, older holdings from the first British Empire as well. And this basically came about from a couple of things one of which was other European powers and the other being strategic concerns and both of them were actually centred around trade because the of the European powers, the ones who were really the most interested in expanding overseas were people like the Spanish in the early part of the colonial period. Uh, they really liked having new territories to rule overseas. The British were mostly in the kind of this kind of middle period concerned with trade they wanted to get in on the lucrative trade in things like spices and sugar obviously gold and silver where they could get it Chinese porcelain um, all sorts of weird and wonderful things they they liked making a lot of money off of trade and of course that did include slaves yes of it uh, and manufactured goods as well cotton um, so all of these things the British wanted to trade in they wanted to make lots of money but the other European powers, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, etc., when they saw British traders, they didn't tend to like them that much, and so you'd end up with fights breaking out. And to be fair, the British traders didn't think too much of some of the European, other Europeans either, but nevertheless, what you ended up with was a series of trading stations and trading missions, often called factories at the time, and then one or the other European power would kick off and decide that they wanted to make all the money from that location and they didn't want anyone else around and so they'd attack or pay someone local to attack and the other power. And when this happened, the British thought this was very unfair and that all they wanted to do was peacefully trade, at least this is what, this is what they would claim. 
And then it was kind of a case of, well, if we can't trade in peace, then we're going to make sure that we can trade in peace. And if that means kicking out the other European powers in the area, so be it. If that involves having to either beat down or co-opt local rulers, then so be it. And then we can all go back to trading happily in peace and making tons of money, can't we? And it's very easy to see how this relatively local reaction on behalf of the local British traders with perhaps some support from the British government, that would end up with you in de facto control of a local area. Repeat this across the numerous other various major trading outposts across the world, and after a few decades of rinse and repeat when you have the one of, if not the most powerful navies at the time, you suddenly find you actually own a substantial portion of global real estate, even though you didn't go out with the intention of doing so. The other aspect to that, as I say, is strategic, because again, if you ha now have all these lucrative trade routes, you want to protect them, and there are certain choke points that are very easy for people to sit off and attack ships coming past, because they don't have much other choice. So things like South Africa um, going round into the Indian Ocean before the Suez Canal was opened, Gibraltar when you're trading into the Mediterranean, and other places like this. And so, yeah, other countries would go, right, well, we can just sit here and attack all these rich British merchant vessels, and the British Navy would say, well, we don't want you to do that, so we're going to shoot at you, except going all the way down there and back up to the UK is very tiresome and leaves vulnerable points, so why don't we take over this little local area here, and then we can safeguard from a nice friendly port right there, and also denying that port to any potential enemies, and then all of a sudden you have things like Gibraltar, Cape Town, etc., all coming into British control there as well. And the final part of it is, uh, yeah, corporate dystopia. If you think uh, futuristic dystopias where uh, corporations have taken over large chunks of the planet are plausible, well, I would like to introduce you to 18th and 19th century India, where the East India Merchant Company, which was not part of the British government, it was a corporation, but a corporation with its own armies, its own fleets, its own governors, etc., managed to partially deliberately and partially by the same kind of methods that the actual British government had acquired a bunch of other places, ended up in charge of the Indian subcontinent. Um, that And a lot of the British government at the time was sort of looking at going, we don't want anything to do with this. What are you doing? Make money. Running a subcontinent is expensive. Also, you're not actually that good at it. Um, and it turned out that, no, a corporation is actually not a very good uh, t entity to run a country. And after a while, the uh, East India Company managed to mess things up so much in India that the British felt obligated to step in and take it away from them. Um, at which point it then became the Raj uh, the British India period, not that the British made the world's best attempt at governing India. Um, the British government was certainly better at managing it than the East India Merchant Company, but that's not exactly the highest of bars to clear. So, yeah, that's that's basically, well, it's gone on a little bit longer than I'd hoped, but it's a short positive history, at least from what I've read of uh, the history of the British Empire, as to how you could say that the, the main holdings of the British Empire were acquired almost by accident. Robert Mitchard asks, with Nelson Dash Rodney being an offshoot of the N3 design, what did the Admiralty hope to, would be gained from mounting the main battery all forward of the superstructure, and why did they then abandon this development in subsequent designs? So the idea of the Nelsons and the G3 battlecruisers and N3 battleships before them was that by putting the main battery well, either all forward or in uh, the uh, earlier designs cases, two forward and one immediately after the superstructure, you would shorten the overall length of the ship's citadel, whereas having turrets in the traditional fore and aft positions meant your citadel would be slightly longer, and thus by shortening the citadel you could either, you would save weight because obviously you didn't need armour to protect quite as the same length of the ship, and that meant with that weight you could either have a smaller ship with the same capabilities, or you could have the same displacement of ship with heavier guns, or you could have the same displacement of ship with heavier armour, or possibly a slight increase in armour and guns at the same time. Um, to give you some idea on the scale that the 
Royal Navy was looking at for the designs that would eventually turn into the N3, the saving weight saving was about 1,500 to 2,000 tonnes, which might not sound too much on a ship that's displacing 45,000 tonnes plus, but that is actually a substantial amount of weight. That's, I mean, that's, as he- that's an entire additional main battery turret, for example, that you're, in terms of weight saving, or possibly an inch plus of belt and deck armour that you're able to add. As far as why they abandoned it in subsequent designs, well, they didn't actually. Um, during the 1920s, as they were drawing up new battleship designs, the all-forward armament kept reappearing in various uh, ways, shapes and forms. Um, now, granted, the initial battleship holiday design that they were going to go for in the early 1930s, if the battleship construction holiday had expired at that point, wasn't a Nelson-style layout. It was a four twin 16-inch gun conventional layout, but even at that stage they were still considering it, and even in the very early stages of what would eventually become the King George V design, they were still looking at it. However, the advances that had been made to modern machinery, as well as other advances in ship design, had meant that the overall savings that you would gain uh, back if you were designing a ship in the 1920s had become a lot more marginal by the mid-1930s, and that, as well as many other reasons, dictated that it wasn't actually necessarily such a good idea to go with the all-forward armament uh, subsequently. Although, um, if the ships had been scaled up to sort of very, very large Yamato-style competing size, uh, then there would still have been a weight-saving margin worth going for. Max Williams asks, as the second most powerful Japanese battleships, which allied battleships could the Nagatos have beaten in a fair fight, one-on-one? So the answer here might come as a bit of a surprise. Yes, the Nagatos are 16-inch battleships, 16-inch gun battleships. However, they do have a rather major weakness, and that is their armour. Now, they're quick at least for the time. Um, They're faster, certainly, than the Colorados and the Nelsons by a fair bit, and all of their predecessors. However, they pay for this speed in protection. Uh, Their armour is just a fraction under 12 inches thick, and it's conventionally slab-sided. Now, to put this in perspective, uh, also, it's not all or nothing. Uh, There's a 9-inch upper strike. Now, to put this into some perspective, That actually, theoretically, makes their belt protection weaker than that of the hood, which is a battlecruiser, which is often times, and sometimes unfairly, derided for having insufficient armour. But actually, for uh, for a shell that actually hits the belt armour, Nagato is less resistant to incoming shell fire than the hood is. And so what that means is that... Other ships that might be slower and less heavily armed, like, say, a late-era U.S. standard like a a Tennessee, or something like a refit Queen Elizabeth, and so on and so forth, these ships can actually hurt Nagato pretty badly. Nagato can obviously hurt them back, but um, when you have this uh, preponderance of firepower and speed, the fact that coming into range to actually hurt your enemy who who will be more heavily armoured will also involve you being equally as vulnerable is not necessarily the world's best place to be in. Uh, This is a problem that would later on also confront the North Carolinas um, but to a slightly lesser degree. So at the end of the day what could they have beaten in a fair fight one-on-one pretty much guaranteed? Probably the early standards um something like something like the Nevada or the R class definitely the Nagato would have had a major advantage over um the unmodernized or relatively unmodernized Queen Elizabeths but once you get past something so like say the New Mexico or War Spike Queen Elizabeth and Valiant the refitted Rs those ships and upwards can give the Nagato a straight up fight because of that weakness in its armour, and you wouldn't necessarily be able to pull a winner out of that. Um, And obviously, as as World War II progresses and radar becomes more prevalent on Allied ships, that 
that that uh, sort of a margin of advantage actually starts tipping more in their favour. Its contemporaries, the Colorado and Nelson classes, are significantly better protected whilst having similar levels of armament, and uh, Nagato retaining its advantage in speed. So again, it can decline a fight, but it's not going to necessarily win a fight with either of those two, um, certainly by the World War II period. And then everything after that is either considerably more protected or considerably more heavily armed one of the two and in some cases both so yeah i mean up to say uh even a king george v the north north carolina or something like that maybe possibly see even a south dakota albeit that obviously the south dakota's electrical problems but never mind but even up to that point that's not to say nagato can't win a fight lucky shots and um early early hits obviously play a big factor and she's certainly capable of hurting those ships but in terms of saying straight up one on one we can we can guarantee that we can beat them no it, it's it's armor scheme is much too weak to guarantee that travis summersides asks I've been wondering if it would have been more effective for lighter ships, e.g. cruisers, to have few large calibre guns rather than the armament they actually had. Obviously, historically, it was chosen to have more small calibre weapons on smaller ships, but it would be great to understand why. So what it comes down to is three factors, which is st ship stability, reload speed, and the armour of likely opponents. And these were effectively the three most important factors that dictated choices of armament at the time. The stability one is obviously quite important. There were numerous examples of what happened when you tried to stick very large guns proportional to a ship size on a relatively small ship, and none of them ended particularly well. At HMS Furious, for example, they tried this approach of having two single 18-inch guns instead of two twin 15 inch and the twin 15 inch really were a little bit too much for courageous and glorious but the 18 inch was so much too much for furious that they only ever installed one of them and uh, relatively quickly took it off at the other end of things you had various destroyers that tried to mount sort of five and a half and six inch guns or 5.9 inch guns um, especially uh, the french and german efforts in the uh, mid 1930s running into world war ii but what you tended to find with those is that, in, say, the French case, you ended up building these kind of super destroyers that were approaching the displacement of a small light cruiser, but still had problems in getting their guns to bear, load, aim, fire, etc., in some kind of vaguely stable manner when the ship was moving at speed, because it was just too much top weight. Or in some of the German cases, you ended up with ships that sincerely wished to identify as U-boats and would do everything in their power to join the U-boat corps uh, whenever the waves looked to be more than a few inches high. And, well, you can mess up with the destroyer to a certain degree in that respect, but if you're going to go through the expense of building a 10,000 ton cruiser, the last thing you want is a ship that is basically unable to go into heavy seas. Um, in actual fact, the Germans ended up with almost exactly this problem in the Königsberg and Nuremberg classes in that they tried to fit what sounds like a relatively normal light cruiser armament, nine 5.9-inch guns, um, on hulls that were really too small and too lightly built for that kind of armament. And as a result, that's why you don't hear much about those classes of ship doing much of anything in the in the Second World War apart from um, operations off of Norway and in the Baltic because they just weren't trusted to sail out into the middle of the North Sea or the Atlantic without rolling over or splitting in half. So that's the stability issue. Now what about the rate of fire issue? Now this actually dictates both the sort of light cruisers and heavy cruisers because when you're looking at heavy cruisers, if they're mounting an 8-inch gun, you might think, well, surely you have a, like a 9.2-inch gun, a 10-inch gun, maybe even an 11-inch gun, a.k.a. the Deutschlands. The problem was that for various factors, a lot of which were related to the fact that it's still humans loading the guns, once you go above an 8-inch gun, the rate of fire drops off quite dramatically. So, for example, 
if you go slightly further back to some of the US armoured cruisers that had 10 inch guns, those 10 inch guns theoretically gave them significantly more firepower than say the 8.2 inch guns of the Germans or the 9.2 inch guns of the British, but their rate of fire was about the same as the 12 inch guns found on most of the pre-dreadnought battleships, which meant that you had a gun that had the same rate of fire as a battleship gun, but had less range and less armor-piercing capability than a battleship gun. Meanwhile, everybody else who was running around with the slightly lighter weapons, okay, fair enough, they also didn't have the armor-piercing capability of a battleship gun, but they could fire a heck of a lot more often, and being an armored cruiser, you didn't have battleship armor to withstand that kind of firepower. So the 8-inch gun, or near equivalents thereof, basically turned out to be about the biggest gun that you could realistically get up to a reasonable rate of fire that was significantly in excess of battleship guns, whilst obviously carrying the most destructive payload. The fact that the uh, Washington Naval Treaty also capped cruisers, <laughs> that was kind of, well, a little bit of convergent evolution going on there. And then you also have the armour of your target. So things like the Pensacola are relatively famous for being severely under-armoured, and indeed were classified as light cruisers originally, before revisions to the naval treaties meant that you had to classify them as heavy cruisers. Um, but one of the big decisions that was facing a lot of navies in the 1930s was that on 10,000 tons, it was exceptionally difficult to get a cruiser that actually did everything you wanted it to. If you went with 8-inch guns, you got firepower, but you either had to sacrifice speed or armor, and, well, they're cruisers, so you can't really sacrifice speed, so you ended up with 8-inch armed cruisers that weren't actually able to stand up to 8-inch firepower, or, critically, at most battle ranges, even 6-inch firepower. And this led to a rather interesting school of thought, which people sort of looked at and went, well, if the cruisers can be penetrated by 6-inch gunfire, and we can get more and more rapid firing guns on a ship if we use 6 inch guns rather than 8 inch guns then actually the 6 inch gun cruiser would have the advantage because although the individual 8 inch shell might cause more damage if we can fire more rapidly we're going to get our hits in earlier and we're going to get more of them in which means we'll probably cripple the 8 inch cruiser's ability to return fire before it gets in much in the way of damaging fire on us and this is what led to the appearance of things like the Brooklyn class and the town class, etc. Now, of course, you could also just cheat and build cruisers that were substantially heavier, such as the Megamis or the Hippers, in, and then you could try and combine firepower to resist 6-inch gun fire with 8-inch guns and thus end up with a ship that would require another 8-inch gunship to face off against it. Um, but that was cheating, and so... Various navies tried not to do that, although some of them less than others. So, yeah, th this is why it was at the time generally held to have uh, more numerous smaller caliber weapons in general. Of course, once you got auto loaders coming into the frame, uh, all of that went out the window because suddenly the reload speed issue was not an issue so much, and you started to see things like the Des Moines. And we're on to the Patreon questions. Yogi Khan says, This is not meant to be negative, but curious. In your videos, you've stated you're a civil engineer working for a local government organisation. How was your university education or experience related to your knowledge of nautical-naval engineering, and what led you to uh, your knowledge of 19th-20th century naval technology and engineering? So, as I've mentioned in the past on a couple of different videos, my interest in naval history and technology actually goes way further back than my university days. My interest in and reading on naval history and warship technology goes back to when I was four years old, when I was taken to Portsmouth Harbour by my grandmother to see uh, the HMS Victory, and, well, haven't really looked back since. So I already had a fair body of knowledge from reading various books and such at various libraries. Um, yeah, I was that kind of uh, teenager. I was the teenager who would quite happily spend lunchtime and free periods in the library uh, reading up on our school's surprisingly extensive and well-resourced history section um, and 
once I'd read all of those books and in year 10 you were allowed out into the town centre, I'd just go over to the library um, over there. And <laughs> the, fortunately that particular library was the central library for the borough. So again, relatively well stocked and you could order in books from other libraries. So I'd just devour all of those. So going into university, um, as I, I had a fair bit of knowledge then and at that point I was like okay right I'm at the university I'm studying my civil engineering however I also know this university does history courses and I now have access to the academic library sources so ordering in from across various campuses ordering in from other universities um, university logins things like academia.edu and jstor and to be perfectly honest, I was like, right, I've done my class on civil engineering, whatever engineering module I was doing at that point. I'm going to go over to uh, the campus that's got all the naval history books and spend all my time reading on that because civil engineering is easy. Naval in naval history is interesting. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I just started using the university's academic resources to devour even more uh, naval history stuff. And then I got a job and... Uh, to be perfectly honest, significant portions of free time once I had a job and was earning money consisted of, oh, I can go down to somewhere like Portsmouth now, or um, I can go over to Chatham, uh, I can go up to the National Maritime Museum, and so on and so forth. So I was uh, basically leveraging almost anything that I did in life to just gain more knowledge of naval history. Um, it got to the point that um, in the latter part of my um, first job, uh, which went ran on for about three years, I actually became so recognisable at the National Maritime Museum before they changed it and made it rubbish that um, a lot of the staff were actually greeting me by name because I'd been there two, three times a week. Now, in terms of how my education and experience helped with my understanding of nautical and naval engineering, well, there's a lot of crossover and it, it, especially when you're studying civil engineering a lot of the modules you do especially in first and second year uh, the way that they classify them in our university at least was by various codes so if you were going to look at an EN module that was a general engineering module that applied to multiple disciplines and then you had CE modules which were civil engineering exclusives and first year was probably two-thirds EN modules second year was about 50-50 third year was mostly CE um, with the exception of the computing section. But anyway, that meant that uh, the, some of the other modules that I was learning were things like engineering materials, uh, which might have shown up slightly in the uh, armour video on naval armour. Um, and that helped me understand a lot more about material science and what these ships were made of, what, how they were built, etc., and I may or may not have quietly sneaked into a couple of uh, history course lectures without telling anyone I wasn't actually on the course while I was at university. Um, but we shall say no more on that. But yes, anyway, things like uh, engineering materials, hydraulics, etc. that are studied quite heavily in civil engineering also directly translate across to naval engineering. So that helped me understand the mechanics of things, um, and then, yeah, ever since then I've built up my library, done more research, and leveraged various contacts and resources that I gained in my university days to get into contact with uh, naval history departments, resources, and uh, lecturers and professors and such like, and also the fact that for the better part of two and a half, three years I actually worked for Richmond Borough Council, was of a fair bit of assistance because part of Richmond Borough's coverage area is Q, and many of you probably know that Q holds the National Archives and it was about 10-15 mm, minute bus ride away so that meant lunch times and afternoons after work when I didn't have much else to do I could go and peruse the National Archives um, which again they got very familiar with me <laughs> so yeah that's a brief potted history of how I ended up where I am now and of course since starting the YouTube channel um, a lot of the income that's been earned since people persuaded me to turn ads on has gone into expanding the library even more. Daniel Ziegler asks I've recently been interested in trying to figure out the financial cost of building some warships would you happen to know where to dig to find the price tag for some ships? 
So you're actually in luck, as a lot of uh, the better books will actually tell you how much these things cost. So something like, say, Friedman's books, um, or Raven and Roberts' books, or even G Doolin and Garsky's books, albeit that a lot of those are a little bit older. Um, a lot of those will actually contain the costs for various ships. Beyond that, because warships tend to be a fairly substantial investment at any point in time, um, and more so the further back in history you go, you also will tend to find, certainly in the sort of the latter half of the 19th and going into the early 20th centuries, that the naval estimates total, or the naval budget, depending on what your country wants to call it, will be publicly available matters of record, as they would have been voted on in Parliament, and the those estimates will have been broken down uh, as sort of similar to the uh, small reading of the 1937 estimates that I did in the last dry dock and those will be they should be uh, matters of public record so you can ask your uh, congress parliament whatever else uh, your government happens to call itself um, for copies of that or if they are being a bit difficult they have to be published documents so there should be copies available somewhere the further back you tend to have to start looking for national archives but even then um, ships costs were so high again that they tended to be recorded in quite extensive detail to justify just why people were spending this amount of money and so those can also be found albeit they need to go for archives so again some of the more detailed um, reference books and stuff will also talk about the costs um, breaking them down even into sort of things like how much was spent on rope, how much was spent on sail, how much was spent on cannon, etc. Um, and if you have any specific uh, inquiries, just drop me a line and I'll see if one of the resources I have uh, mentions it. Tyler Williams asks, You've mentioned in several videos that the North Carolina-class battleships had severe vibration problems at speed. What was the cause of the vibrations, and was anything done to resolve the problem? Uh, did the issue hamper the class's ability to serve as a carrier escort? So the causes of the issues with the uh, North Carolina's propulsion were basically down to two things. One of which was that they'd adopted a new hull form for the US as a result of implementing new machinery, but also wanting to ensure that the ships had as much torpedo protection as possible without compromising on speed, because obviously more torpedo protection, wider hull, slower speed, um, and so they'd made all sorts of weird and wonderful design changes to the hull structure in order to retain speed and as well as using uh, the newer higher pressure machinery. What all of this meant was that, amongst other things, they installed a pair of massive skegs to run the shafts, uh, two of the shafts down in uh, past where the hull began to curve up. And when they ran everything up to, well, not even full power, they ran up to about 25 knots which is about three quarters power and then they found that the propellers were causing resonance that was resonating with the structure of the ship um, and with its with the propeller and propulsion machinery itself to the point that they didn't even take the ships up to full power um, because they were incredibly worried about what would actually happen uh, to give some idea of what was going on it was reported that not only were the propellers vibrating the propeller shafts were vibrating and that this vibration was carrying all the way up into the turbines and of course this was causing the entire aft of the ship to vibrate up and down quite dramatically. This was worrying from a, a from a structural perspective but b more immediately from the fact that it, there was a very real possibility that if they ran the ship up to full power the vibration would either destroy the turbines which would leave them crippled in the water or possibly worse it might cause the propeller shafts to break free of their mountings at which point you'd end up with a self-inflicted wound similar to the one that doomed the prince of wales where the propeller shafts rip free and rip open a massive section of the underwater part of the ship <coughs> um it was a bit of an outside chance but mm, the idea of your own ship basically committing suicide by running up to full speed is not something that you want to take lightly. So, did it uh, hamper the ability to serve as a carrier escort? Yes, definitely, because at that point they could only safely be run up to just a fraction faster than the average standard, so they were nowhere near uh, able to run with the carriers um, at that point. 
in terms of what was done to resolve the problem, well, it had to be resolved pretty darn sharpish because there were an awful lot of ships that were currently under design or construction that used a similar kind of hull structure and similar kind of machinery. So there was every possibility at the time these uh, problems were identified that the South Dakotas and the Iowas would also be completely unable to maintain more than 24, 25 knots without shaking themselves to pieces. Eventually, what they found, well, they proposed a whole raft of measures, some of which were more extreme than others, but they eventually found that the easiest way of doing it was to actually change the propellers. So by changing the number and size of blades on the propellers, they moved the resonant frequency uh, that the propellers were generating as they cut through the water to frequencies that were apart from the structure of the ship, or at least... The, the the frequencies generated at high speeds were apart from the structure of the ship. Um, so that did cut down on the vibration levels to a point that the ship wasn't in danger of murdering itself or its propulsion plant. But it did have the unfortunate effect of moving those uh, unacceptable vibrations, albeit at a somewhat lower level, to another part of the speed regimen. Um, so by the latter part of the Second World War, when you had Washington operating with the British in the Arctic convoys, it was still noted that by the Admiralty that vibration at between roughly 17 and 21 knots was still a massive problem. But as long as the ship was below or above that speed, it wasn't quite as bad. The vibration problem never went away entirely. They had to um, add additional... Uh, bracing for the turbines and for the propeller shafts as well as the new propellers and even with all that the vibration levels that were present in the aft of the ship made the aft fire control system pretty much unusable previously the vibration made the entire fire control system unusable um, and they ended up having to put in extra bracing on the aft fire control uh, system and the mast to make sure that it was actually stable and vibration free enough to actually be usable in combat and you can actually see this in later wharf uh, photos of the North Carolina class you'll notice the aft mast and superstructure is a lot more heavily uh, braced up compared to when it was at launch but eventually they did get the ships able to be at least operational at their design speed and so they sort of carried on with that TC Green asks, how was the protective capability of naval armour tested? Did they just take it to an artillery range and start shooting at it, or was there some other way? At the end of the day, nothing quite beats taking a big slab of metal down range and then blasting away at it with naval artillery, and to a large extent this did remain the favoured way of experimentation. Um, you didn't necessarily always have to do it on an artillery range, um, especially as armour got more substantial and the layout of the protection scheme extended beyond just the simple slab of metal. Quite often later tests would be done either on old ships or on older ships that were obviously designed to be sunk, but old sh older ships could also be equipped with new armour layout. So this was the fate of quite a number of uh, Royal Navy and US Navy ships. Uh, once they were past their usable um, service lives, they'd have sections of them rebuilt or added to to simulate the armour of a new ship and then the ship would be shot at and the damage would be considered. So then you'd only shoot at it enough times to score some hits so you could evaluate the armour, you wouldn't just blast away until it sunk, although occasionally the ships did sink, but for that reason they were lightened and usually moored in very shallow water, so just in case you accidentally sunk the target you could refloat it relatively easily. Now, all of this did eventually feed into, um, obviously, a large data pool. And from that data pool, you could start to draw certain common trends, especially once you had the material quality of the armour plate under a lot more control. So, as time went on, this allowed various countries to derive te charts, tables and formula so that could in theory calculate on paper how much armor a given shell would penetrate depending on the value sort of the qualitative values of the shell and the qualitative values of the armor so the usn empirical form formula for armor penetration is one that's got a fairly wide degree of currency and so 
as armor and guns and things like this got more and more expensive it tended to shift more towards the theoretical where they they would either consult the appropriate table or the f appropriate formula run the numbers and then calculate well based on what we know of our shells and what we know of armor in theory this should penetrate x amount um but where possible they did still like to back this up with um field tests although given the more exotic natures of certain armor schemes as you got into the second world war and the 1930s these field tests could sometimes end up throwing up weird values or values that seem to say what you wanted them to say but in practical reality you might not actually say that and that well the things might not actually happen that way and this was because again due to the problems with scale and cost quite often substitutes would be made so you might fire a smaller gun at a known velocity in order to simulate a larger gun at another velocity so for example the italians when they were testing the Littorio's armor scheme uh, they used a smaller weapon from one of their older dreadnoughts and they basically said well in terms of energy delivered if we fire this gun at this velocity at this plate at this range that is the equivalent of this armor being hit by a 15 inch gun at traveling at a different velocity at a longer range and while kinetic energy wise yes that may have been the case in that particular armor test case they were looking to see if the decapping layer would work and uh, one of the major factors in uh, shell decapping uh, is the actual diameter of the shell because the diameter of the shell dictates things like how much of a gap you need between the decapping layer how thick the decapping layer needs to be um, and as i said how well the gap between the decapping layer and the armor belt and if you use a smaller shell you have fundamentally changed that equation a smaller shell will be decapped by a thinner amount of plate with a smaller gap between it and its and the main armor belt as compared to a larger shell regardless of anything else and uh, that's why i still tend to hold the opinion that they did make some mistakes with that and thus the latorio's armor scheme probably wouldn't have been as resistive to incoming shell fire as they thought it would be and uh, that's based on more extensive testing that was done by other powers which did derive formulas which can then show what the spacing should be uh, but yeah so that's that's various ways of testing protective abilities of naval armor and then finally for this week we have a question from a competition winner because one of the uh, light cruiser design competition winners decided he would like his prize in the form of a question in the dry dock so okay here it goes the question is why, other than a handful of Clemsons, wasn't the 5-inch 51 caliber used by US destroyers instead going to the trouble of developing the 5-inch 38? So a lot of this was covered in the dry, I think last week's dry dock, where we talked about the, the various grades of US and 5-inch uh, gun. But to expand a little bit more, the 5-inch 51 caliber was a very good anti-surface weapon, um, and that's why it was used on well tested on some of the clemsons because it had a lot more hitting power than the four inch that the clemsons came by with came with by default however there was then kind of a dead period where the u.s didn't really design or build any destroyers as was covered in our destroyer interwar destroyer development video but once it came to designing new destroyers in the 1930s the Kagero class had come about and the Kagero class amongst other things had dual purpose main guns as well as the air threat becoming more and more obvious and so it was thought that well destroyers they don't have a lot of spare displacement so fitting them with lighter caliber anti-aircraft guns is probably going to be quite difficult so if you because i mean if you look at something like a battleship if you're going to put well let's see what the time you're talking about with the chicago pianos so you're talking about either 1.1 inch guns or batches of 50 cal machine guns you can stick a few dozen of those on a battleship and it's not really going to change its displacement or stability all that much 
if you try and stick, say, a couple of quad 50 cals and a quad 1.1 inch on a destroyer, well, one, you've got to find the space because they're pretty compact in the first place, and two, it's exactly the same amount of weight, but proportionally it's a lot more, which has uh, a significant potential to destabilize the destroyer. So it makes a lot more sense to have your main guns as something that could be used both for anti-surface and anti-air. And with the Kikera's already proving the concept, it was kind of like, well, we might as well try it on our own ships. Uh, and as it, there was also the additional advantage of the fact, obviously, a 5-inch anti-aircraft shell will go a lot further, and when it bursts, will have a much more lethal radius than a bunch of 1.1-inch or 50-cal rounds. So this is... Those were the primary drivers behind looking for something that could be used as a dual-purpose main armament, which was, as I say, of course, the 5-inch 38 caliber gun. There was also one lesser but still important issue, which was the fact that being a shorter weapon, the 5-inch 38 caliber weighed significantly less than a 5-inch 51, which, when you're talking about destroyers, might well be the difference between being able to mount four guns or five guns, for example so you could get slightly more 5-inch 38s compared to 5-inch 51s. And that brings us to the end of this dry dock. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you again in another video.